Wild Hearts, a brand new hunt em up style game from Koei Tecmo in collaboration with EA under the EA Originals branch, is going to be hitting the world in February of 2023. No matter how you spin it, the creature hunting genre is quite a small group of games, at least done in this general style, and so of course every time that a new one is released, it garners quite the attention from fans of this genre. Here on the channel, we were very fortunate enough to be granted an early access look at the first couple of hours of the game in a very early build, and of course we are here to talk about it for you all as fans of these kinds of games, or even just for you if you're someone who's just generally interested in what Wild Hearts is all about. Over the next few days and weeks, we'll all be taking our hand, talking a little bit about our various experiences with this game, as everyone on the channel gave it a go on their own time. But today I'm here to tackle a very specific topic for you all. The weapons! What are they, how many are there, and absolutely most importantly, how do they actually feel to use in hunts? First up, in this specific build of the game, we had a limited number of weapons to play around with, and we know that in the full game on release there will be 8 different weapons to choose from, which is quite a nice variety to start off with in a new IP. There were 5 available for us to actually play in this early access build, but we're only really allowed to talk about 3 of those in depth as well as showing those 3, but to put it simply, all of the ones that I got to try felt really cool, and definitely are all quite unique from each other, each offering a different gameplay experience when hunting the kimono, which is the term for the monsters themselves, and each interacting in their own unique ways with the Karakuri, which is the name for the various hunting tools that you've seen in the trailers. That said, trailers are one thing, but now I've actually had a few hours of hands-on experience with a few of the weapons myself, so what better time to talk about them than now, now that I've actually been able to hold them in my own two hands. We are currently allowed to show and talk about three of these weapons, the first of which is the Karakuri Katana. That's a sword! That's a sword. For anyone who hasn't seen the trailers, this weapon is a sword with a sheath, of course, and it can be powered up to then unleash a special mode, where it gains extra range and functions more like a, a whip. Shards of the blade held together by tiny little carrot curry strings to let you fling it all around. So, how does this one work exactly within the game? Well, you have three combos, really. One of which is just your general slashes. It keeps you generally on the spot and does decent amounts of damage. One of them gives you a load of forward momentum, allowing you to swing around the battlefield and move around the kimono as you are fighting, and then your larger combo actually uses the sword in combination with the sheath itself to fight in a sort of dual weapon style. The third combo is generally the strongest while also offering quite some movement, but it also consumes your stamina to use these attacks. Stamina is a very important resource in Wild Hearts, it is obviously used for general dodging, but for each and every weapon stamina is a part of your stronger attacks, and so there is a constant balancing act going on of wanting to use your stamina to increase your damage output, while also keeping enough around to get yourself out of any dangerous situations you could find yourself within. The katana is probably the friendliest weapon to this mechanic, and I would consider it probably the beginner weapon, at least out of the ones that I've tried, and it still outputs incredibly high damage even without putting its stamina meter within the danger zone. The main mechanic at play with this weapon then is the gauge in the bottom left. As you deal damage to a kimono, this gauge will gradually build up, and then once it is full you can activate your special power mode to turn the katana into the proper whip sword that you've seen in the trailers. In this mode, all of your attack input are pretty much the same, with the main difference being that every one of them has more range, a slightly different animation, and does notably more damage. The strongest attack that you can do with this weapon in general seem to be through interacting with the Karakuri though, which does make sense considering the weapon itself is called the Karakuri Katana. Specifically, I'm referring to the special attack the weapon can do when jumping off of a box, where you get bonus height and then do a big downward stab with loads of damage, the specific amount of damage being relative to how high you jumped from. Three boxes of height is more damage than two boxes, and so on. What's important to mention here while talking about the Karakuri is how actually natural this mechanic feels mid-combat. The actually building of Karakuri is an extremely momentary effect. It doesn't really take you out of the combat, it, it doesn't feel immersion breaking. It all flows together in a very nice way that feels natural to the pace of the game. In this early access version, we unlock three Karakuri through our playtime. The first is this box, the second is a spring which launches you forward in the direction that you are moving, and then the third we unlocked at the very end is a torch that you can use to launch into a special fire-based attack, as well as putting a fire effect on your weapon in general for a short duration after doing so, adding more damage. The second weapon that we are allowed to show you is the Umbrella. I'm very popping, y'all! And this is a weapon that really drew me in in my time with it. We hadn't seen much of it in the trailers beforehand, but this weapon is quite the unique and fun experience to actually play. Of the ones that we can show, it probably has the highest skill-to-output ratio, meaning that this is the one you will see way better results with 
the better that you get at the game, and the better you know the moveset of the kimono that you are fighting. This weapon's main mechanic focuses around a parry. When you press the button for a brief window, if you are hit by a kimono's attack, it will ignore the damage and fill up your gauge in the bottom left of the screen a small chunk. If you parry while mid-air, it can also send you higher up into the air. For this weapon, the gauge in the corner isn't used for some special powered mode like the katana, it is instead a damage increase. The more full the gauge is, the more damage every one of your attacks will do. This gauge fills up a large amount with every successful parry, and a small amount every time that you hit the kimono, and if you stop engaging the monster for even a few seconds, it will start to decrease rapidly, and this includes if you are hit by an attack. Outside of this, the umbrella has two real combos, a chain of five hits that do decent damage quickly at your light attack button, and one that functions as a lunging attack that launches you into the air at the end of it, and then pressing that same button a second time will do a thrusting downward stab to put you down onto the ground. The main function of this weapon, though, actually is to stay within the air, where it can do more damage faster and be more likely to hit the weaker spots on a kimono's body, which I just absolutely love as a design philosophy. I mentioned earlier with the katana that the attacks take stamina are a big mechanic in this game, and the main one that takes the stamina for the umbrella itself is just the parry. The light attacks don't. Every time you parry, it uses stamina, whether it's successful or not. When you enter the parry stance, you can follow this up with one of two relatively strong attacks, and if you choose to, you can parry instantly again once you've entered that attack. So if you parry at the wrong time and realize that you parried at the wrong time, you can cancel that with an attack and then parry again to get it right. However, that will lead up twice as much stamina to do. The main gameplay loop with this weapon then is actually pretty cool. Use the lunging attack to put yourself in the air, and then spam the light attack combo for lots of damage, because when you're doing these light attacks, you will actually sort of float in the air on the spot. Then you parry when the monster is attacking, which you can do mid-air once again, and whenever you do the parry, it will also reset your light attack combo so you can start again, which allows you to stay in the air even longer, doing the stronger combo and building up your gauge. As well, since the aerial combo is your strongest one, you can actually just use the parry as a combo reset even if the kimono isn't attacking you, which will allow you to stay in the air for the maximum amount of time possible. When you are ready to go to the ground again, press the heavy attack button to do the downward thrust for a nice chunk of damage as well. As a whole, this weapon functions in an extremely satisfying way to actually play. The parries feel good to get, the gauge gives you a sense of urgency to keep in the fight and keep applying damage, and the weapon has lots of ways to do that in an evasive and protective manner, with the only real limiting factor being your stamina. This weapon's coolest Karakuri interaction that I found was the springs board itself, as this lets you re-enter the fight from a distance or evade from a more difficult attack without the use of stamina, which this weapon hinges on quite a bit. Then the final weapons that we are allowed to show you today is the bow. I'm getting my bow and arrow. And as you may expect, this weapon played totally differently from the other two as well. Being the only ranged weapon that we could experience within this playtest, it was quite the unique perspective on the gameplay. Of course, as you may expect, avoiding attacks is much easier when you can deal your maximum damage from 15 to 20 feet away, but to compensate for this more than any other weapon, the bow relies quite heavily on stamina for pretty much every single thing that it can do of consequence. Also, for anyone wondering, I know there's lots of buildings and trees and stuff that you can climb around. No, you cannot shoot from those. The kimono will not just be free shooting like a duck sitting in a barrel. I know that's not the expression, but you know what I mean. You can't just sit out of their range and shoot at them because the buildings themselves will just block the arrows. So you have to be on the ground. You have to be in the zone. You have to be actively fighting the creature and giving it a fair chance. The bow focuses around two main mechanics then. The first of which is the shot type switch. You can hold your bow either sideways or straight up. When it is held sideways, it is referred to as Haya shots. When held straight up, it is called Otoya. The simplest way to describe how this weapon works is that the Haya shots are a setup and the Otoya shots are the payoff. Every time a Haya arrow hits the kimono, it will leave a little energy spot glowing where it connects. And if you then hit that same spot with an Otoya arrow, it will pop said energy for a load of extra damage. You can charge shots for both of these shot modes, and charging a shot costs stamina, which is what can make you do a lot of damage, but what also uses your stamina. On top of this, there is the secondary mechanic called bolstering, which you can do up to two times per shot, and the act of bolstering itself also costs stamina. It is worth mentioning that if you switch shot types and immediately bolster, the animation will be faster than if you just bolstered from a standard position. When you bolster your shot, it changes how said shot works. By default, in both modes, you just fire one arrow at a time in a normal fashion. In the sideways stance, if you bolster once, you will change it into a multi-shot, which when you hold the trigger down, will rapid shot your Haya arrows to make it a bunch of tiny little energy nodes in the spot that you're aiming. If you bolster a second time, you will instead initiate a sort of aerial barrage of arrows which rain from the sky in bursts of three. There are 
much harder to aim in this stance, just sort of landing at a set distance in front of you and hitting it a spread across the monster, but this is the way to launch off the most Haya arrows in one go. Instead, if you are in the straight up stance, the Otoya stance, your first bolster will turn your Otoya shot into a piercing attack. That will do a medium amount of damage as it passes through the monster, and also has a good chance of interacting with all those little Haya energy nodes. And it obviously does more damage the longer the monster is that it passes through, the longer the parts are that it goes through. If you bolster this shot type a second time, you will instead be locked on the spot while you charge the bow, and the resulting shot will be a massive singular pop of damage. And this specific attack has a particularly high modifier when popping the Haya energy spots too, referred to as resonance. In short, to do the most damage possible, you want to launch off sideways bow shots as rapidly and plentifully as possible into the weakest parts of the kimono. Then do the twice bolstered straight bow mega shot to hit all of the energy nodes, thus popping off a massive storm of numbers. This gameplay loop is extremely satisfying in every way to do on repeat, to mix and match with the other different versions of the bolstered shots, and I just absolutely love this weapon as a representation of a bow in a creature hunting game. The coolest attack this weapon has, in combination with the Karakuri, is of course with the jumpable box itself, where you can launch yourself up and then fire a high damage arrow while mid-air, which then pushes you back. Interestingly enough, if you aim this right, you can actually land right back on the box that you jumped off of, and so I can definitely see this creating some interesting shenanigans in the full game later on. This weapon can also sort of spam dodges like crazy while charging shots, too. It gives you a bunch of mobility to avoid being hit while you are pulling back the bow string, but this eats up stamina like all hell, so again, you have to consider your stamina carefully when you are using this weapon. That said, this dodge animation, when done on repeat, just looks sort of funny, so I'm not entirely sure if this is an intentional function or not, as once again, we are playing on an incredibly early version of this game, and yeah, there are bugs around. So, that is a little bit of a taste then, an overview of the three weapons that we are allowed to show you currently in Wild Hearts. I will say that I did personally play two more of the weapons that I'm not really supposed to talk about in detail, and both of them were unique from these three, and both of them were also quite fun. So, you know, keep your eyes open and stay excited for the future, because I genuinely think this game will surprise you and quite likely beat your expectations for it as of right now. Personally, as someone who spends a lot of time in these hunting style action RPG games, I just really enjoyed the combat. Obviously, this is essentially just the first few hours of the game, so you have to take it from that standpoint with a little bit of a grain of salt. It is essentially the tutorial creatures and the weapons being shown are in their most basic format, but there is a decent amount of depth here regardless. There is actual hit weight when you are swinging these weapons that makes them feel like they're actually trying to slice through an actual living thing. And just in general, every weapon is satisfying to play in its own way. I'm definitely getting pumped to play this game in its full format when it releases, and I cannot wait to see the rest of the weapons that we have in store for us as well. I hope you've all enjoyed this little taste of Wild Hearts and its weapons. Keep an eye out for more Wild Hearts videos on the channel because we'll be releasing them soon as well if you're interested. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye